Hello, my name is Drew Stephen. I'm an associate professor of musicology at the University of Texas at San Antonio. During the past 25 years or so, I have been very passionate about the natural horn, or the horn without valves. This instrument is a forerunner of the modern French horn, but also the instrument for which many of the great pieces in our repertoire were written. This includes works by Bach and Handel, Haydn and Mozart, Beethoven and Schubert, all the way to Brahms, Saint-Saëns, and even Ravel. I'm going to demonstrate some of my early horns and discuss how they were played to give you an idea of how the horn was heard, understood, and performed in earlier eras. Although the horn became an essential member of orchestral and chamber music in the 1700s, it was actually one of the newer additions to performing ensembles. There are very few pieces written for the horn before this time because it was considered more appropriate for signaling than making music. To find the origins of the modern horn, we look not to the traditions of music, but to the beginnings of the courtly European hunt in the 8th century. There were many types of hunt, but the most respected and prized was the chasse -cours, a hunt carried out by strategy rather than weapons. A suitable animal, usually a male deer that was at least five years old, was carefully selected beforehand and then pursued to the point of exhaustion by men on foot and horseback, aided only by a pack of hounds. Since this method of hunting took place over several hours and required the coordination of large numbers of men and hounds over vast distances of dense forest, a means of communication was essential. Initially, this was accomplished by rhythmic shouts called ue. These were very quickly transferred to horns so that they could be heard over greater distances. Until the 16th century, the hunting horn was a small crescent-shaped instrument called a corn that was typically made from an actual animal horn. We can get a good idea of its sound and the way it was played by looking at a similar instrument, the shofar. The shofar is an ancient instrument that has been used for thousands of years in Jewish religious services. Like the corn, it is made from an animal horn, usually a ram's horn like this one, with the tip removed and carved to form a cup shape similar to a modern brass instrument mouthpiece. Due to its shape and length, it is mainly limited to just two notes, usually forming the interval of a fifth. The precise interval is not as important as the rhythms, which consist of patterns of long and short notes. We find a similar focus on rhythm in the early hunting horn calls written for the corn. Each call or cornure was distinguished by patterns of long and short notes similar to Morse code. There are calls that identify and pay tribute to specific animals, calls that commemorate celebrated people and events, calls to encourage the hounds, and calls that communicate specific information about every stage of the hunt. The hunting book of Gaston Phoebus, written in 1387, provides a verbal description of the calls. For example, to inform the company that the animal has been taken, the hunter is instructed to play first a long note and then as many short notes as you would like, one after the other, and some of the other horns should respond to the others, and finally play two long notes, one after the other. Arduin's Treasure of Hunting from 1394 contains 15 calls that are notated using shaded and unshaded boxes to represent long and short notes. As hunting practices became increasingly elaborate and sophisticated in the 16th century, changes were made to the horn and the horn calls as well. Although the size and shape of the corn was well suited to the physical rigors of hunting, there must have been disappointment in its limited melodic possibilities. After several experiments, a solution was found in the trompe de chasse, an instrument that combined a longer tube, thus allowing for the production of different pitches, with a hoop-shaped design that could be worn on the shoulder when walking, over the body when on horseback, and still be quickly brought to the lips to sound a call as required. Although clearly not as practical as the corn, the appeal of this instrument must have been enormous. When the trompe de chasse was adopted as the standard hunting horn at the court of Louis XIV around 1680, other courts across Europe quickly followed suit. A visiting count from Bohemia left two of his valet behind so they could learn the instrument and teach it to others at his court. In England, one of His Majesty's trumpet makers offered French horns for sale as early as 1681. With the success in the field, it was only a matter of time before the hunting horn would be used in music ensembles as well. 
My trompe de chasse is an instrument made by Marcel Auguste Raoult sometime around 1850. It bears an inscription around the bell indicating Raoult's address and his title as an official instrument maker to the emperor. His monogram is also stamped on the opposite side. The lead pipe is too small for a standard horn mouthpiece. The mouthpiece I use is small in diameter with a sharp rim and a deep cone shape. The sharp rim apparently helps hold the mouthpiece in place when sounding the instrument on horseback, although I've never had the opportunity to test this. The only real difference between this instrument and the original trompe de chasse of the 18th century is the design. Whereas this instrument is wrapped two and a half times with an inner diameter of about 40 centimeters, the trompe was originally wrapped just one and a half times with a much larger inner diameter of 70 centimeters. The reason for, was, for this was so that it could fit over the three-cornered hats that were fashionable at the time. Once this hat fell out of fashion at the end of the 18th century, the design of the horn was tightened to make it more compact. The trompe de chasse is typically fixed in the key of D with no tuning slides or movable parts to make any adjustments in pitch. Otherwise, it is very similar to a horn in D and can pretty much play the same notes of the harmonic series as the modern horn. The fundamental, in this case a sounding D, is practically unattainable. The second, third, and fourth partials, DAD, are playable but are not used in hunting horn calls, only in recreational ensemble playing. Like the modern horn, the trompe's main range begins with the fourth partial, a written middle C, and extends upwards by two octaves. <laughs> One thing to notice is that the 11th partial, a written F, is very sharp compared to standard systems of tuning. This pitch isn't avoided or adjusted, but played where it lies naturally. It is the distinct interval in the hunting horn repertoire. I'll return to this note in a minute. Although the design and length of the trompe resembles the modern horn, the playing technique is very different. Since the calls must be heard across vast distances of dense forest, the hunter musicians play with a strident, piercing tone. They also give the calls a distinct rhythmic profile. Most of the calls are written in 6-8 time, but the rhythm is played more emphatically in performance, instead of da-da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Finally, there is a type of ornamentation called the tayote, which gives the melody its character. The tayote is derived from the hunting cry tayo, which was used to encourage the hounds. It is similar to the English term tallyho. The standard repertoire of hunting calls was written in the early years of the 18th century. Although new pieces have been written since then, they mostly follow this model. A good example was La Vue, a call that was sounded when a huntsman made the first visual identification of the quarry. Like most calls, it follows an ABA form, stays within the confines of the harmonic series, begins with the muscular interval of a rising perfect fourth, and includes the unusual tuning of the 11th harmonic. Although it is notated in 6-8 meter, it is typically performed with the swung rhythm and several of the Tayote ornaments added in. Since the hunt was restricted to the nobility, and the nobility were the main patrons of music, composers realized they could earn favor with their patrons by bringing the sounds of the hunt into the concert hall. The horns were at first treated as a separate group from the orchestra to avoid issues of compatibility, but soon the instrument was accepted as a regular member of music ensembles while still retaining its associations with the hunt and the outdoors. One of the first composers to do this was J.S. Bach, who treated the horn as a solo instrument in his Brandenburg Concerto No. 1. Bach cleverly illustrates the changing role of the horn in the music. During the first 12 measures, the horns play a hunting call in triplets that is at odds with the 16th notes in the other instruments, but then switch to 16th notes to match the style of the rest of the ensemble. Thank you. 
Although Bach was probably writing for instruments that were also used in the hunt in the Brandenburg Concerto, the horn soon underwent modifications in order to meet the demands of ensemble playing. You can see some of the changes in this copy of an early 18th century model made in Nuremberg by J.W. Haas. Whereas the tromp is fixed in pitch and can only play in a single key, the Haas horn has a terminal crooking system that allows it to be used in several keys. Basically, you can take off the end and add extra bits of tubing to make it longer. It doesn't have a tuning slide, but the crooking system allows for tuning bits, small pieces of tubing that add length to the instrument to make small adjustments in pitch. Since this instrument did not need to be carried over the shoulder or the body, it could be more compact, although it still maintains the distinctive hoop-shaped form. From the paintings and written descriptions, it seems clear that the horn was held with the bell in the air to get a bright, clear sound, similar to the hunting horn. We can either see it like this, or like this, or even like this. The music written for the instrument still stays almost exclusively within the confines of the harmonic series, although the written F, the out-of-tune note that was a distinct feature of hunting calls, creates problems for modern players. Composers do not avoid this note, and even distinguish clearly between a true F and F sharp. This suggests that players at the time were able to make adjustments. I suspect this is something they learned how to do with their daily practice. Since pitch was not standardized and changing from place to place and probably even from day to day, they were just very good at bending notes across the entire range of the instrument. Since this is something we don't know, learn how to do today, the best solution seems to be nodal vents. These are holes that are drilled in the instrument that when opened, allow for a true F and F sharp to be played. There are no Baroque instruments from the Baroque era with nodal vents, so we can be sure that this was not a technique used at the time but it does allow us to play the notes in tune while still holding the instrument with the bell in the air to get a bright, clear sound. Although it may seem very limiting to restrict the melodies to the notes of the harmonic series, composers were very imaginative within this constraint. Here, for example, is a very elegant melody from one of the minuets from Handel's Water Music, written in 1717. One of the most important innovations in horn playing came with the discovery of hand stopping around 1750. This innovation is credited to Anton Hampel, a low horn player working at the court of Dresden. What Hampel noticed is that by putting his hand in the bell, he could adjust the pitch of any note to fill in the gaps of the harmonic series. It is important to remember that hand stopping, at least initially, was a specialized technique that was known only in a few places, used only by a few experts, and limited to certain situations. According to Heinrich Dominik's description in the very influential method for horn of 1808, Hampel was not experienced in his youth with the practice of stopping notes and restricted the usage to slow pieces. It was left up to one of his disciples, Giovanni Punto, who was born only in 1746, to realize the full potential of this discovery. So even though hand stopping was known as early as 1750, it was rarely used at all in the entire 18th century. If one looks at the horn writing in the operas and symphonies of Mozart, Haydn, and even Beethoven, stop notes are rare or non-existent. Looking at the music, it seems obvious that the two approaches to playing existed side by side. Haydn's first concerto, written in 1762, stays mostly within the confines of the harmonic series and was probably played with the bell in the air. Although there are several non-harmonic series notes in this piece, they are too short to be played using hand stopping. By contrast, Mozart's concertos were written for a specialist and feature a completely different style of writing. Notice how the many stop notes in this passage add very elegant contrasts of tone color.
By 1800, detailed descriptions of hand stopping were appearing in the method books and the technique was becoming widely adopted. This also led to further changes in the design of the instrument. This is a copy of an instrument made in Mainz by F. Korn in the 1830s. As you can see, it is much more compact so that it can be held close to the body with a larger bell to allow for more flexibility in hand stopping. Instead of the crooks being added to the end of the instrument, they are added to the body of the instrument. So the basic proportions remain the same. It comes with a full range of crooks that can be used in any key, from C, low B flat, all the way up to high B flat. And since the crooks change the length of the instrument, they also change the character of the sound. The longer crooks, such as B flat, C, or D, are not very agile, but they have a warm, rich sound. The shorter crooks, such as G, A, or high B flat, are more agile with a brighter sound. As stopping techniques developed, composers and performers responded with great imagination to exploit its full potential. The basic idea is simple. The notes of the harmonic series are open. If one puts the hand in the bell, one bends the pitch down to get a semitone lower. And by completely closing off the bell, which essentially shortens the instrument, the pitch is raised by a semitone. That means that with a combination of hand positions and some adjustments with the embouchure, one can obtain every note of the chromatic scale. And you may notice that from C to E, there's a full tone between D, so that one is one that needs a bit of adjusting. It also means that each note has its own color or flavor, so that composers could get an incredible range of colors, not only from key to key, but even from note to note and within each key. Beethoven exploits this beautifully in his fourth horn solo from the Ninth Symphony, written in 1824, Notice that each note, especially in the scale at the end, has its own color. Although today we strive to get a uniform sound throughout the entire range of the instrument, composers at the time clearly prized the horn's ability to obtain a different sound from note to note. It is interesting that Beethoven gives this prominent solo to one of the low horn players. Even 75 years after Hampel's invention, low horn players were still considered the specialists in the use of hand stopping. Also, even though this passage requires an advanced use of the hand in the bell, the horn parts in the rest of the symphony stay mostly within the confines of the harmonic series. Interestingly, even though valves were invented and added to brass instruments, starting in 1814, 
They were slow to be adopted and mostly seen as yet another option for playing the horn. Valves were often added to the instrument as an attachment so that one could easily switch between the two techniques. Basically, the crook would come off and a valve attachment would go on. In fact, for most of the century, both instruments existed side by side. Many composers specify either valve horn or the natural horn, and many symphonies call for a pair of valve horns and a pair of natural horns. In 1865, Richard Wagner expressed a preference for the valve horn in the published preface to the score of Tristan und Isolde, yet in the very same year, Johannes Brahms published his trio for horn, violin, and piano, which demonstrates the full potential of the natural horn. From the opening phrase, he shows off the remarkable range of colors the instrument was capable of producing. Even though very few people today play this instrument, the horn without valves, we continue to play the music that was written for it. I hope this short introduction to the instrument has given you a better understanding of how this music was performed in earlier centuries. <laughs> ¶¶